Okay, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Let me just make sure that this is up and running. Yes, okay, good. So let me find the slides. Sorry, I was in a meeting and I'm, I had to get out of that meeting and then go into this thing. So just give me a moment while I get to the actual slide that we need to get to. <clears throat> okay, so we were talking about sickle hemoglobin. So as I mentioned, there are many variants of hemoglobin in the population. Some of them are, or most of them are actually fully functional. They're just genetic variants that exist amongst different, uh, sometimes it's about ethnicity, sometimes it's about geographical location, for whatever reason, different specific um, types of hemoglobins have evolved, let's put it that way, in the population. But there's one in particular, which is associated with disease, and that one is called sickle hemoglobin, or hemoglobin S. And as I was mentioning last time, this specific type of hemoglobin <clears throat> has a mutation, it's a genetic mutation, in which a glutamic acid or glutamate, which is a polar acidic amino acid, and therefore will have a negative charge in its side chain, gets replaced via valine, which is nonpolar and therefore has a uh, zero charge. So when you go from something that's negative to something that's zero, what actually has happened is that there's been a gain in a positive charge in that structure. So it turns out that what happens with sickle hemoglobin is that you can actually diagnose the disease by taking blood samples and running electrophoresis on the red blood cell proteins. And then you'll notice that when compared to normal hemoglobin A, the hemoglobin S, because it has a slightly higher positivity associated with it, it's going to migrate closer to the negative electrode of the uh, electrophoresis analysis, and then that's the way that you diagnose the disease. So what happens, let me go to the next picture because this one is a little bit more informative. Everything that I'm going to say that was in the previous slide, I'm going to say it using this little picture as, um, as the reference because it's just easier with pictures, right? So if you notice, this uh, slide is simply presenting how in the sickle version of hemoglobin, amino acid number, what was a glutamic acid on the normal hemoglobin, amino acid number six, has been changed to a valine. <clears throat> so that actually introduces a small hydrophobic patch on the surface of the protein, which becomes fully exposed as the protein becomes deoxygenated. Remember how we discussed how when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, there's a little bit of a change in shape. Well, if you look at it from the reverse standpoint, as oxygen leaves hemoglobin, there's, a, there's also a change in shape sort of in the opposite direction. So as the oxygen is lost from that hemoglobin, that little patch is exposed. And what that ultimately leads to is that that hemoglobin, which now has an odd shape, because of that change that suddenly exposed the, um, the patch, the hemoglobins that would normally be fully independent of each other and soluble, and then the red blood cell would remain intact, these hemoglobins will aggregate in these fiber-like structures. And what happens is that these hydrophobic patches will associate with one another through London dispersion forces and it forms this sort of a fibrous type of a structure that ultimately form these needle-like entities within the body of the red blood cell, and it causes the red blood cell to acquire this, what we call a sickle shape, okay? So what happens is that these red blood cells are no longer flexible. So normal red blood cells, as they pass from the arterial side let's say this is the arterial side over the over here is the venous side as they're passing through the capillaries and they're losing their oxygen normal hemoglobin simply slightly changes its shape as we've discussed and 
the, but it doesn't have any true effect on the overall shape of the red blood cells. And in fact, the red blood cells are, are quite flexible and malleable. They're able to conform their three-dimensional shapes. Let me change color so you can see it here. They're able to sort of, they're kind of squishy, let's put it that way. They're able to uh, squish themselves uh, through the capillaries as they're going through, and then once they reach the other side, then they're fine, right? So what happens with these sickle cells, uh, the, 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 the red blood cells of the patients who have sickle disease, is that as they're going through the capillaries and they're losing oxygen and delivering the oxygen to the tissues that they're passing through, this aggregation of the, of the hemoglobin happens and it forms these needle-like structures fibrous structures within the red blood cell, which causes the red blood cells to become rigid. They can no longer properly, uh, you know, distort themselves to get through the capillaries. And therefore, what ends up happening is that many of them actually break apart into pieces. So this is what's called lysis, okay? So if I go back to a couple of slides, what happens is that um, these uh, chains, as those cells ultimately are having problems getting through, they can actually cause vaso occlusion. They can block the capillaries. And that vaso occlusion leads to what we call ischemia, which is low blood flow that ultimately causes tissue damage. And that can cause severe pain. Okay. So as those sickle red blood cells are getting backed up, if you will, in these capillaries, um, they are also prone to lysis, and once those cells lyse, we call that hemolysis, then they are ultimately leading to uh, what we call sickle cell anemia. So a sickle cell anemia is a disease that is the, pretty much the hallmark of this particular uh, genetic mutation. So what happens is that in sickle cell, there are two sort of variants of the disease it turns out the defect is actually in the beta globin protein. So it's actually a genetic mutation that's coming from the beta globin gene. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to get to, because of the time constraints that we have, we're not going to get to talk about uh, genetics and genetic material and DNA and RNA. I'll give you a brief uh, overview. Every single protein that your body makes for whatever function its uh, recipe, if you will, is encoded in your genes. So a gene is nothing other than a formula to make proteins. The only reason you have a genetic material is to make proteins because it's actually the proteins that are carrying out all the ultimate functions that are encoded in those genes. So the person who has sickle cell disease is carrying a defective beta globin gene. Now, as we know, we all have pairs of chromosomes. Half of your chromosomes, which is where all your genes are contained, half of them come from your mother, half of them come from your father. So if you happen to carry a defective beta globin gene from one of your parents but not the other, that means that 50% of your hemoglobin will be normal. You will have 50% of hemoglobin A and then the other 50% is hemoglobin S because this particular gene is what we call a uh, co-dominant expression, meaning that both genes that you carry from both of your chromosomes that carry that gene, both of them are simultaneously and what we say co-dominantly expressed. So if one chromosome is carrying a normal hemoglobin A, the second chromosome is bringing in hemoglobin S, that means that half of your hemoglobin is fine. It's the other half that's not fine. So when that happens, the disease is much less severe. We call it sickle cell trait. So these patients suffer from much uh, less severe disease. They do not have as many issues with uh, hemolytic anemia. Their pain uh, level is not that high. Um, in order to help with the disease, these patients have to be uh, typically very well hydrated. They need to intake a lot of water because that ensures much more 
uh, blood flow through the tissues that helps with the cat with the red blood cells getting from point A to point B as they travel through the capillaries. It lowers the severity of the disease. So if you have sickle cell trait, meaning only 50% of your sickle of your of your hemoglobin is sickle the hemoglobin, then the disease is not as severe. However, if you happen to be that unlucky individual in which both of your parents are carriers of a uh, sickle cell of, of a sickle hemoglobin gene, and when they marry and have children, the child ends with both of the defective genes. Then, in those cases, 100% of the hemoglobin in those individuals will be sickle cell, uh, sickle hemoglobin. So they ca they suffer from the full blown disease, which is at its maximum expression which we then refer to as sickle cell anemia, okay? So much more severe, much more frequent episodes of these hemolytic anemic attacks and painful vaso-occlusion crises. These patients, because they're technically or practically anemic for most of their life, they require frequent blood transfusions, chronic pain management. So this, of course, brings a whole other layer of issues. Any person who's in chronic pain management, there's the whole uh, other discussion regarding potential for abuse, opio opioid addiction. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big complicated problem. People who have frequent blood transfusions can also have all sorts of problems with suddenly becoming sensitive to all sorts of different things that are coming from receiving uh, multiple blood products throughout their life. So it's a very, very complicated disease and it's due to a mutation in hemoglobin. All right, so we need to talk about another um, important aspect of hemoglobin, and it is uh, what we call carbon monoxide poisoning. So it turns out carbon monoxide, if you compare its structure to oxygen, uh, it has a similar structure and size and shape when you compare it to O2. Uh, the only difference, of course, is that O2 is completely nonpolar, whereas CO has polarity uh, between carbon and oxygen because of the um, difference in electronegativity uh, between carbon and oxygen. So there's a little bit of a minor structural difference in that regard, but it turns out that uh, hemoglobin can bind carbon monoxide, in fact, with much higher strength then it can bind oxygen. So if you look at the uh, equilibrium constant for the uh, association or binding of uh, CO to, um, hold on one second, I have to calm my dogs here for a minute. All right, I'm back. So what happens is that the carbon monoxide actually binds to the uh, hemoglobin with much greater affinity than oxygen does. And what that leads to is that the carbon monoxide will very easily displace the um, oxygen from the hemoglobin. And the moment you lose oxygen from hemoglobin, then you have no oxygen carrying capacity in your blood. So what's interesting about this, those of you who may be working in an emergency room at some point or looking at taking care of patients in the uh, hospital, uh, you may see this disease, uh, this, this, this situation um, of carbon monoxide poisoning. So what happens is, and you probably have learned this in physio in, in A and P, if you compare oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood, arterial blood, which is oxygenated, has a has a red, much brighter red color. If you look at the blood that's on the venous side, it's much more darker, much per, much more purplish in color. Well, it turns out that the uh, carbon monoxide carrying blood 
is far brighter in terms of its red color than the oxygenated blood. And it's so bright uh, red that it actually causes, as the blood is flowing through the capillaries, it causes, uh, particularly in certain portions of the body in the skin on the surface, it produces this bright cherry red color. And this is what, this is the, what we call the carboxyhemoglobin. So if I go back one slide, the, uh, when CO binds to a hemoglobin, it's referred to as carboxyhemoglobin. Okay, so this is a, let me just do a little parenthesis here. You need to be very uh, mindful of the terminology. There's oxyhemoglobin, which is oxygenated. There's deoxyhemoglobin, which is the one that doesn't carry anything. <clears throat> it's deoxygenated. There's carbaminohemoglobin. That's the one in which CO2 is covalently bonded to hemoglobin, not on iron, but in nitrogen atoms that are dispersed throughout the surface of the protein. And then now we have carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is when CO binds to the hemoglobin and produces this hybrid, this B shouldn't be there. Uh, the hybrid between, it's a covalent bond pretty much. The CO has bonded through its carbon atom, through the lone pair on the carbon atom to the iron that's in that hemoglobin. And that's what produces a very bright cherry red color that can be seen in the tips of the fingers. It can also be seen in the lips of the patient. So not uncommon, or let's say, it's not that common, but when, you, when, when a patient comes in with carbon monoxide poisoning, um, all you need to do is look at their lips and the tips of their fingers. Sometimes it's so bright red, you think the patient has lipstick on, and when you try to clean it off, nope, it's not lipstick. It's the very bright red cherry color of the, uh, and you already know, this is, this is very diagnostic of carbon monoxide poisoning. So the way to treat these patients is to put them on what we call a hyperbaric oxygen chamber in which they are given oxygen, um, at slightly higher pressures than what's, uh, than what's normal atmospheric oxygen. And the whole point of that is to displace the CO from the iron and replace it with oxygen, okay? Um, in some cases, depending on how long the patient has been down, um, there's a recovery, but you know, in, in many cases, these are like these are these are most commonly uh, suicide attempts. Uh, it can also happen in the home, um, and this is why everybody needs to have a carbon monoxide uh, detector uh, alarm thing, like a fire alarm type of thing. It's not for fire; it's carbon monoxide, because carbon monoxide you can't smell it, you can't detect it, other, other than with these uh, contraptions that you have in your walls and your ceilings in your house, and it's deadly. So sometimes it's for whatever reason there's been a, an exposure unintended and the patients are found and again depending on how long it's time has been it's, it's if they're if, if they're going to recover or not in other cases it's suicide attempts um so may, you probably have seen in movies and tv shows and things of the sort uh people that take the exhaust of their car they put a hose in it they bring it into the car they lock themselves up in the car and that's the carbon monoxide that's coming from the incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons um, that exist in uh, in, in regular uh, motor exhaust fumes. All right, so interestingly, this is just an interesting application of CO. It turns out that um, carbon monoxide also binds not only to hemoglobin, it also binds to myoglobin, which is a major uh, protein that exists in uh, skeletal muscle. And one of the, uh, the major function of myoglobin in skeletal muscle is to serve as a depot of oxygen when muscle is doing all kinds of strenuous exercise and some oxygen can be stored within the myoglobin. Well, similarly to what happens with hemoglobin, when CO binds to uh, myoglobin, it actually acquires a uh, bright red-ish type of a color. So, you know, when you go to Target and, you know, not so often anymore, but all these meat markets and you look at this beautiful red meat, well, guess what? In many cases, that meat has been treated with carbon monoxide. Um, if you don't treat it with carbon monoxide, then it turns out the meat has uh, what, what some people may interpret or, or see as a less appealing color. So, you know, just because your meat is nice and red doesn't necessarily mean that it's fresh. You need to look at the date, okay? Now, 
you can see, you can observe meats that's like this. And again, if it has not been treated with carbon monoxide, that meat is perfectly fresh, perfectly fine. So it turns out uh, it's this practice of uh, treating meat with carbon monoxide has actually been banned uh, in Europe and Japan, not so much in the United States. So again, when you're looking at the, at the beautiful meats that you may be looking at in a uh, shelf at the supermarket or wherever you're going, um, never mind the color. I mean, that makes it more appealing. That's the reason why they do it. What you really need to be looking at is the date because that's what truly tells you how fresh that meat is. All right, so now let's talk about some um, other proteins that are very important physiologically. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about collagen, we're going to briefly talk about keratin, and then we're going to talk about uh, immunoglobulins, which is the scientific term for antibodies. So collagen is the most abundant protein in the human body, uh, about 30% of body mass is collagen. And uh, it turns out that, as we briefly mentioned previously, it actually is the foundation for all connective tissues within the body. So all of your tendons and ligaments, cartilage, bone, teeth, the underlinings of your blood vessels, the underlinings of your skin, and all of the framework of all organs and tissues, what holds it all together. Of course, each tissue has their own specific tissue specific cells that are, you know, liver cells, heart cells, pancreas cells, kidney cells, whatever they may be. But they're all technically suspended, held together within a framework of connective tissue. Collagen is the primary protein that holds all of that together. So because it is a structural protein that must provide sturdiness and, and structure, uh, it falls within the category of proteins that we've already sort of mentioned, which are fibrous proteins. So remember, the ones that are sort of water soluble that can move around from point A to point B carrying uh, things or doing functions or you know controlling entry and exit of things from cells, et cetera, those are all globular proteins. The ones that serve this structural uh, feature and function that must hold things together, must hold everything in place to ensure structural integrity, these are what we call fibrous proteins. So these fibrous proteins, as we've discussed previously, have this rope-like arrangement because they have to have that type of a structure to provide that structural integrity. They are very, very strong, very, very resilient to degradation. They're highly water insoluble. Again, imagine if all these proteins that are holding everything together were slowly dissolving in water, we'd be a massive gelatinous blob that we couldn't hold ourselves together. So these proteins need to provide that very sturdy framework to hold everything in place. And because of that, then they have to be resistant to chemical change because imagine again if all of these proteins that are holding everything in place were suddenly changing uh, chemically with exposure to god knows what is entering the human body then that wouldn't be a, a successful uh, you know structural feature so it turns out if you look at collagen it has a relatively unique composition of amino acids uh, that is what provides this this very important structural feature. So about a third of uh, uh, collagen is glycine. If you remember, glycine is the simplest amino acid that technically has no side chain. It's a hydrogen atom hanging off of that um, of that alpha carbon. So in terms of size, if we're going to refer to glycine, it's the smallest of the amino acids, and that has a unique role in the structure of collagen because it helps to create a protein structure in which there's little interference between different components because that side chain is so small, it's a hydrogen, it doesn't really pose any structural interference with other components of the protein. And then there's another one that is proline. Proline, I'm gonna show you pictures momentarily. Proline is the only amino acid in which the alpha carbon side chain that comes off actually wraps around and covalently binds to the nitrogen. So it actually, the skeleton of the structure forms a ring. And that ring is very rigid, which is also important because again, it's not flexible to go 
everywhere in three-dimensional space, it actually introduces certain structural constraints that is important in the maintenance of the sturdiness of the functions of collagen. And there's a variant of proline, which is hydroxyproline. We're going to talk about that. Um, hydroxyproline is a proline that has been covalently modified. It turns out it's in that ring piece, that side chain that comes off the alpha carbon and wraps around and binds to the nitrogen. There's, an, uh, there's a hydroxy, i.e. an alcohol, an OH group that's introduced into that uh, cyclic or ring form of a side chain. And as we're going to learn, this is vitamin C dependent. So collagen, uh, in order to be fully and functionally formed, requires that we have vitamin C available. This is why vitamin C is so important. We're going to talk about diseases associated with a lack of vitamin C. Amongst them are deficiencies in collagen structure. And we call that structure hydroxyproline. So if you look at the percentages, uh, about 25% of collagen is proline, and about just a little bit under half of that is hydroxylated in the, in the side chain. And then the remaining 10 or so percent is alanine. I mean, there's other many other amino acids, but it's about 10%, which is significant. Um, if you realize it doesn't add up to 100%, so there's many other amino acids. But about a third is glycine, about a quarter is proline in combination with proline, hydroxyproline, and then about 10% is alanine. Alanine is the second smallest amino acid. The side chain is a single carbon uh, side chain with uh, three hydrogens. It's a methyl group. Okay, so there's also some very unique repeating sequences involving glycines with prolines or glycines with hydroxyprolines, with sometimes something in the middle. Um, and that repeating pattern uh, is also important in the proper three-dimensional structure and three-dimensional shape that collagen ultimately acquires. So uh, we're going to go through the process of how collagen is actually biosynthesized. So it turns out that, again, we probably are not going to get to this because this would have been part of, the, of that sort of molecular genetics chapter, uh, more details on, on how proteins are actually synthesized in cells, but let's just sort of in an overview type of discussion. As the protein is being synthesized, uh, a single polypeptide chain will arise, and then these uh, structures that are destined to become collagen uh, are just single fibers of collagen, still in a precursor stage. They're known as pre-pro-collagen, okay? So it's the precursor to what is known as pro-collagen, which is the structure that is ultimately going to become collagen. So those of you who end up taking uh, upper division courses in biochemistry, you're going to be learning about all this terminology, pre, pro, and all these little things. Okay. So what happens is that typically as proteins are being synthesized in the cell, this happens in structures known as ribosomes. If you learned uh, a little bit of cellular structure in anatomy and physiology, you would have learned about ribosomes. These are small little structures within the uh, cytoplasm of cells. They're actually composed of a combination of protein and RNA. And uh, that ribosome is the machinery that is responsible for the synthesis of proteins. So when proteins are synthesized, uh, many of them have to be modified after they've been initially synthesized. And that what we call post-translational modification or post-synthetic modification happens in the endoplasmic reticulum, also known as the ER, not emergency room, but endoplasmic reticulum. So these polypeptides that are meant to become collagen, the initial proteins that are made is called pre-procollagen. That enters the endoplasmic reticulum where it's ultimately modified. So that the first thing that happens to that pre-pro collagen is the hydroxylation process. And that happens in uh, some of the proline residues uh, side chains. It turns out it also happens in some of the lysine amino acid side chains, as we're going to discuss. Um, so here's the, what I was talking about, the proline. Again, uh, prolines uh, 
contain, here's the carbonyl of the peptide bond. Let me clean this up for a minute. And I'm going to zoom in so that it's easier to um, look at. So um, here is the carbonyl of the peptide bond. So this goes in that direction to form a peptide bond. And here's the nitrogen of the previous amino acid. And it goes that way to form another peptide bond. And then notice, this is what I was saying. The side chain wraps around and actually covalently binds to the nitrogen. So this is quite rigid. It's not able to rotate and flip around and up and down in all directions. So that actually provides a certain structural uh, integrity uh, that is unique to, to collagen. And now what happens, as I mentioned, just a little under 50% of all of the prolines uh, are going to be hydroxylated. So a hydroxy group is introduced into those proline residues. And this is a vitamin C dependent mechanism. If you do not have proper amounts of vitamin C in your diet, you are unable to do this to introduce these hydroxy groups. And that then has a consequence in that the collagen that results is not right, right? Something's missing and is unable to be properly assembled and it's not able to do the proper uh, structural features that it's supposed to impart the body with. So your connective tissues are kind of wobbly and we're going to discuss that in a minute that leads to a disease called scurvy in which your teeth start falling out you have all kinds of problems with that right so anyway um it's as i mentioned it's the glycine and the prolines and the hydroxy prolines that are then imparting the collagen with a unique structure turns out because of the presence of the proline that is this so, sort of rigid uh side chain these pre-pro collagen chains, if you will, are unable to engage in the normal type of secondary structural elements that we've talked about, uh, beta pleated sheets and alpha, and alpha helices and things of the sort. What ends up happening is that three, three of these collagen chains will um, wrap around themselves and each one each one, let me just go back and clarify here, each one of those chains will form not an alpha helix, but an extended helix structure. So it's not exactly an alpha helix, it's sort of like a, like it's been pulled. And therefore that sort of doesn't allow for a proper alpha helix to form. So not only that happens, each one of those, three of them will wrap around themselves and that forms what we call a triple helix, okay? So it's the presence of these glycines, prolines, and hydroxyprolines that will ultimately allow the assembly in a rope-like fashion of three of these um, extended helical structures of the pre-pro collagen. And when they come together to form this triple helix is what we call it, that's when the structure is called pro-collagen. So the pre-pro is the single str uh, strand that forms this extended helix. Let me change colors here to blue. So this thing that I'm showing here in blue and another one, I don't think this green is gonna come out. No, it's too light. Let's do purple. This, another one that's sort of wrapping around in purple and then let's go with black that's gonna stand out. The third one that's in the back, each of these individual chains is the pre-pro collagen that has been, that has sort of formed this uh, extended slinky type of a thing. And then they, the three of them wrap around themselves to form what we call the triple helix, which is what we're showing here. That, at that point is when it's known as pro collagen. So it's still not yet fully formed collagen. It's on its way to becoming collagen. So this is why it's called pro collagen. So how does this structure hold itself together? As with most uh, proteins that are interacting with each other, it turns out that it's hydrogen bonding that is holding together that intertwined structure of the uh, pre-pro collagens coming together. And then the hydroxyprolines, those OH groups that were introduced because it's OH that introduces additional capabilities of engaging in hydrogen bonding. And it's those hydroxyprolines that actually form an additional layer of hydrogen bonds 
that further stabilizes. So there's hydrogen bonding interactions happening here between these uh, entities as they wrap around each other. Now, I mentioned hydroxylysine. So lysine contains a nitrogen in its side chain. It's, I think it's three or four carbons, and at the very end, there's a nitrogen. It's one of those basic amino acids. So it turns out that along the side chain of that hydroxylysine, also there's glycosylation on the OH group that's introduced. So when you have an OH group, remember, you can form an acetal glycosidic type linkage with a sugar, right? So sugars are actually added to the structure of the procollagen on its surface. So you have, an, you have a, lyse, a hydroxylysine uh, sticking out of here. There's an OH group coming from the hydroxylysine and another one and another one and another one, right? So these hydroxy groups coming from the hydroxylysines are sites where sugars can actually be attached to those positions that also is important in providing collagen with its proper structural integrity. That process is also vitamin C dependent. So if you do not have vitamin C, not only can you not form these hydrogen bonding interactions that hold the triple helix together, you can also improperly form these hydroxy groups on the lysine side chains that are necessary for the sugars to be attached to. All of that combined leads to a structurally deficient, structurally improper collagen. So you're not going to have good structural integrity of your connective tissues and then that leads to all sorts of problems. So once that has been properly formed, assuming everything is fine, the hydrogen, the hydroxyprolines, the hydroxylysines, the sugars have been intact, uh, attached and everything's fine. At that point, this all happens in the endoplasmic reticulum. The pro-collagen that has now been properly assembled then proceeds to the Golgi apparatus. If you remember from your uh, anatomy and physiology, you probably studied this in microbiology as well. Uh, cells also have what we call the Golgi apparatus. It's another level or layer of uh, pr protein, and in fact, it's beyond proteins, other structures, lipids and things as well. They get modified even further than, the, than what they would have been in the endoplasmic reticulum. So this pro-collagen at that point uh, continues to become modified. Additional sugars are added uh, to the um, to the. This is this is where the sugars are actually added to the hydroxylysines, and then that's what ultimately forms the fully formed uh, pro collagen. So that then leads to the secretion of these of the pro collagen outside of the cells that are making them. There's a wide variety. Well, not a wide variety. There's a handful of different um, cell types that produce connective tissue. Uh, amongst them, fibroblasts, for example, is one category, but there's others. These are cells that are all over the body uh, that are, again, integral components of all connective tissue. They're there to sort of uh, help and make these types of structures that are uh, important to maintain uh, the structure of our connective tissues. So this, this pro-collagen that's secreted, this now happens after the fact, after it's been excreted from the cell. Uh, it has um, these loose ends that we call that are unable to provide the final structural integrity that the collagen will ultimately need. So these structures are known as tropocollagen. Tropocollagen. Uh, once its loose ends are removed, these loose ends need to be removed. So this is now what's called, after they've been removed, that's what is known as tropocollagen. And then these tropocollagen structures become the building blocks to ultimately construct and build these much larger aggregates, which we call fibers or fibrils, that then ultimately provide collagen with its, its final structure, okay? So the tropocollagen um, is further modified by an enzyme that exists in the extracellular space the enzyme is called lysyl oxidase. And what it happens is that, that those hydrox some of those hydroxylysines um, 
sorry, some of the lysine uh, side chains. There is a reaction that happens uh, involving the nitrogen that's at the end. There's what's called an, uh, a, uh, an oxidation process. Um, it's, it's a, uh, I've, I've, the name suddenly escapes me, but it involves the nitrogen. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Um, anyway, it's an, it's an, it involves, you know, so the lysine ends in NH3+, plus, and then it turns out that it's going to end up forming a carbon doubly bonded to a nitrogen. Let me just write it over here. So the chain is ultimately having a CH2 NH3 plus. And what the lysyl oxidase does is that it converts this to a CH doubly bonded to a nitrogen. Okay. So this is done by the lysyl oxidase. And ultimately this bond here is removed and you end up with an aldehyde at this end of what was a lysine. So this is what it is saying here. The lysyl oxidase will oxidize a portion of terminal amines to aldehydes. And what this allows is for portions of the tropal collagen in one structure of, of collagen to cross-link, meaning form a covalent bond with another tropo collagen molecule that's next to it. So this is what ultimately leads to these collagen fibrils that are very, very sturdy. We call the process cross-linking. So this process is also dependent uh, partly on vitamin C because it's a combination of both the hydroxy lysines and the regular lysines that are converted to these aldehydes. And if you don't have the hydroxy lysine, then you're going to have issues with the proper cross-linking of the collagen. That's yet another layer that produces a defective collagen. So here's sort of in picture form, probably should have jumped to this one before giving you all that um, narrative there. So again, this is the precursor chain. This is what we call the pre-pro, pre-pro collagen that ultimately goes through the endoplasmic reticulum and then goes through the Golgi, right? And it goes through all this post-translational modification. And then it gets excreted from the cell as the pro-collagen, but then these loose ends that are not properly interacting with each other need to be chopped off and removed. And that's what then produces the tropo-collagen. Here they're referring it to as the collagen molecule. Same thing, tropocollagen, right? Tropocollagen. So this is when the lysyl oxidase comes along and these guys will cross-link with each other and will assemble. So here, we, this is now zooming out. Each one of these little strings here that you see is one of these guys, right? So there's many, 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 many of them that will assemble and they will cross-link with each other to form what we call a collagen fibril. Now, many, many, many of these collagen fibrils will ultimately aggregate in this much larger structure, which is what we ultimately call the collagen fiber. So the fiber is multiple fibrils that have cross-linked with each other. Those, those, uh, the cross-linked structures that form the fibril are the tropocollagens that come from the loose ends being removed from the procollagen. The procollagen comes from the pre-procollagen that was synthesized within the cell. So it's various levels of assembly, starting from the simplest, meaning constructing the protein to begin with, and it goes through several layers until ultimately you have these collagen fibers that is what forms the framework of every connective tissue that exists within the body. So I mentioned scurvy a little while ago. When you have deficiencies in vitamin C, because you have a lack of hydroxylation of proline, that turns out to pr produce these looser triple, triple helices. If I go back a couple of slides, I mentioned that you need those um, hydroxy lysine, hydroxyprolines to form these hydrogen bonds between the uh, helice, the, the, the extended helical structures that form the, uh, uh, the triple helix, if you don't have that, this is very loosey-goosey. And you don't have a strong, sturdy uh, uh, pro-collagen and um, ultimately uh, tropo-collagen, okay?
So it also leads to the lack of the hydroxylation of the lysines. This interferes with the glycosylation. So you can't add those sugars, right? And that also has issues with, uh, with uh, structural integrity of the protein. Now it turns out there are, so scurvy is actually an acquired, an acquired collagen deficiency. Uh, it's simply the result of poor vitamin C in the diet. And it, it's an interesting story. This was actually prevalent uh, during the world wars. Um, I think this was discovered actually this whole issue on, during the second world war. Scurvy has been known forever, but uh, it turns out that the, the sailors in the, in the, that were for months and months at a time in, in the ships um, during the war, they would develop scurvy. They would, their teeth would fall out and then they wouldn't heal properly because you don't have good, good collagen and whatever. And then it was discovered that, of course, if you give the patients, uh, the patients, the sailors, um, uh, citrus fruits like limes and lemons and oranges and things of the sort, particularly lime and lemon juice on a daily basis, that would um, cure their problem. The, the scurvy would go away. It was because these fruits have large amounts of vitamin C, and then that's kind of solved that problem. So, um, there's other genetic diseases, genetic disorders associated with collagen. One disease is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This is one among several uh, genetic disorders of collagen that we know of. And the problem with this one is that the enzymes that are responsible for removing the loose ends in that uh, pro-collagen are actually deficient. They're non-functional or they don't properly function. And uh, therefore, the proper assembly of collagen um, is is not is not so the I'll put it this way the assembly of collagen is not proper it, it occurs improperly and that leads to problems with collagen assembly and ultimately collagen function so because the fibrils and the fibers are uh, improper due to the presence of these extra pieces this is and this shouldn't be here so if you suddenly have this whole thing and ultimately this whole thing having these extra pieces that are kind of all over the place and they shouldn't be there. So this fibril is not as strong and sturdy as it should be. The ultimate collagen fiber is not as strong and sturdy as it should be. And that causes all sorts of problems um, in the, in the uh, assembly and functions of collagen. And then the last one is, uh, there's another disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, um, which is called brittle bone disease. And this is actually a, uh, another congenital de uh, defect. It's actually on the collagen uh, gene itself. And there's actually different types of collagen. We're not gonna get into those details. Um, if you go into upper division courses in biochemistry, you may learn about the different variants of collagen in the population. Uh, it, this one happens to be at what's called type one collagen, and it's a genetic mutation um, on the collagen gene. And if you carry that mutation, what happens is it particularly becomes manifest in the bones. Uh, we call it brittle bone disease because of that. So um, these bones are very prone to fracture. And what obviously becomes apparent uh, early in life, particularly when children begin to walk and start bumping into things and falling off of things and as all children do. And this is I'm um, just particularly for the nurses the, or, or even people who are in, in PT and things of the sort. But this is th this disease has in many cases been mistaken for child abuse. So you have to be very mindful if you're making an accusation of child abuse on a parent or caretaker or whatever for a child that comes with multiple histories of fractures. In many cases, that's what's happening. However, one of the things that needs to be ruled out, particularly if it's early on, and if you're looking back at history, this, this child has had multiple fractures and this and that. I mean, doctors that are savvy will know this, pediatricians will know this, but again, osteogenesis imperfecta is, could be a diagnosis for a child that has multiple fractures. It's not necessarily that the child is being beaten or abused or anything of the sort. It's because it's simply they have a genetic disorder in which their bones are uh, brittle and they're prone to, um, to fracture with, with just a minimal uh, impact. All right. So as I mentioned, these crosslinks that form between collagen, it turns out that um, 
as we age, um, the crosslinks that happen within collagen actually tend to increase over time. And that actually makes the collagen a little bit less elastic. So as we age, our connective tissues, our skin, and anything that has connective tissue will actually ultimately become less elastic and, and more rigid, if you will. So this is in part uh, why as we get old, our skin will wrinkle. It's because of the number of crosslinks that uh, happens as our skin is regenerating, which is a normal process. It actually uh, increases over time. Uh, it can actually be worsened by UV exposure. So those people that love to, uh, not this summer, right, but um, love to go to the beach and sit there for hours and hours and hours getting their sunburns and things of the sort. It doesn't have to be at the beach. You can actually go to a tanning salon and do this as well. Any uh, exposure in excess, as with everything in life, uh, to uh, UV radiation, which is one of the major things that's coming from sunlight, that can uh, worsen the process of the cross-linking of the collagen. And uh, this is also why as people get older, um, this also has a hormonal component, particularly in women, but um, as you get older, your bones become more brittle, so you're more prone to fractures and things of the sort. Uh, it's because your collagen is sort of less elastic. This is actually one of the reasons why as we get older, it's, it's tough to get old, right? Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why uh, as you get old, your eyes, you start losing vision. Some people do it as even as young people. I have, I've had glasses since I was like eight or nine years old, so it's, that's not necessarily because of this. But normally people who, as they age, they start losing their vision and whatnot. It's because the vitreous humor, the, the gelatinous material that's inside your eyes, that also is largely connective tissue mainly, or one of the major components is collagen. That causes changes in that vitreous body of the eye, and that can also lead to vision loss. And then from a nutritional perspective, this is why the meat from younger animals, so veal and you know lamb and things of the sort that are younger animals, if you compare, for example, veal to beef, beef is older, veal is younger, and the meat is much more tender and things of the sort. It's because the collagen uh, in the veal is much more flexible. There's, you know, and, and when you when you look at a at a beef, uh, it's it's less less flexible. So the meat from older animals is is different, largely or in, or in, at least in part because of the differences in, in the collagen structure that holds that that tissue together. All right, let's talk about now immunoglobulins, which are antibodies. So about 15% of all of your plasma proteins, which is a significant amount, are immunoglobulins. Okay, also known as antibodies. So these immunoglobulins are, um, are made by a subclass of white blood cells that are known as B lymphocytes. And their function in the body is to recognize foreign entities that are deemed to be noxious, infectious, or harmful to the body. Now, their function is to recognize foreign things. It turns out the body makes immunoglobulins in a completely random fashion. Those of you who may be taking clinical immunology with me in the fall are going to be learning with excruciating detail how is it that immunoglobulins are generated. The body generates them completely randomly, meaning they have the potential to also recognize and attack anything within the human body as well. Now, there are mechanisms that are specific for destroying, deleting, interfering with, um, shutting down any type of antibodies that are in fact self-reactive. That is not always successful. You may have heard of what are known as autoimmune diseases, and many of these autoimmune diseases actually result from a failure, a defect, or the sudden escape of these B cells that should have been shut down on, or killed or turned off, that they can suddenly start making antibodies against 
structures of the own body, and then you can develop an autoimmune disease. So for example, type 1 diabetes is that kind of disease. There's hypothyroidism that, that's, that, that's, that can be that type of disease. There's different kinds. And then again, we'll, you, may heard, you may hear about these diseases in other courses. So what these antibodies are meant to do, if everything's working perfectly and properly, is that they will intercept these foreign, potentially hazardous entities that enter the body, and they will clear them from the body so that they produce no harm. Okay, so these proteins, they're proteins, they're produced and secreted into the circulation in mass quantities after you've either had an infection, so you've, if you've been exposed to something live that's out there, like for example, COVID-19, again, there's, there's, if you listen to the news and everything that's being uh, produced out there, there's this whole about antibody testing and antibody this and antibody that. It's because they're looking to see if your body has produced antibodies against the virus and therefore you technically are immune to the virus. It's not always that clear cut. You can actually have antibodies against something meaning that you've been exposed and your body has reacted to it by producing antibodies. Doesn't necessarily mean the antibodies are going to be successful ultimately in actually clearing the infection. This is what happens with HIV, for example. HIV, you can get infected, your body generates an antibody response, and the way to diagnose a person as being HIV positive is for looking for these antibodies in their blood that tells you, oh, this person has been exposed. Does it mean they've cleared the disease? In fact, you don't clear it with antibodies. So we don't know much about COVID-19 yet. Stay tuned for that as time progresses. Um, but the bottom line is that these entities are produced in mass quantities and their function is to intercept and ultimately clear things. As I mentioned, certain autoimmune diseases are associated with the production of antibodies against self-antigens. Antigens are the entities that these antibodies recognize, okay? So when, the, when an antigen enters the body from an outside source, the body will recognize it, and then antibodies start being produced against that substance, okay? All right, so in terms of structure, Immunoglobulins are uh, complex structures. They are composed of four polypeptides. It's actually two pairs of polypeptides. And uh, two of them are larger than the other two. So they're called heavy chains because they're much larger. And I'm going to zoom in here so that it, it's easier to look at. So the two heavy chains are shown here. I'm going to highlight them in red and they're identical, they're a, they, they come as a pair. I mean, they're, they're synthesized as individual chains, but they ultimately pair up. And they hold themselves together by a series of disulfide bonds at this region here, which is what we call the hinge region. So there's a portion in which the two heavy chains are heavily associated and aggregated with each other. This is what's called the FC portion of the immunoglobulin. And then there's another portion where they diverge from each other, okay? And they sort of separate. So they form this sort of a Y framework, Y-shaped framework. And then it is in that portion that has diverged from the pair. That's where the light chain will then have the opportunity to associate with those now diverged pieces of the heavy chain, let me clean this up. The light chain and heavy chain are also associated with each other via disulfide bonds. There's also hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces and ionic forces, all of those things. So in fact, it turns out that all four possibilities are involved in holding it all together. But physically, linked to each other, obviously, it's going to be these disulfide bonds that are going to link the light and the heavy chain in the portions where they diverge, and then the two heavy chains are held together, specifically in this, what we call the hinge region. This portion where the light and heavy chains are um, bonded to each other, this is referred to as the FAB or FAB regions of the amino acids, of the, um, of the immunoglobulin. So we have one FC portion and two 
fab portions. Again, the reason why they're called like that are beyond the scope of this course. This is just immunology lingo, just FYI. All right, notice how the two heavy chains interact with one another, but the two light chains do not. Each light chain independently interacts with one of the heavy chains through that region of the fab that ultimately forms the fab portion. Now, the very tip of the fab portion up here this is where the antigen binding site is. That's where the antigen interacts with the protein. So you have your, your antigen, I'm scribbling here, this is technically the antigen. It's going to bind at this specific region. And it turns out that each immunoglobulin has two identical antigen binding sites. So a second antigen that's identical would also have the ability to be bound on this section. So it's like, it's like a structure that has two hands. And the two hands, imagine your body, your, your legs are the FC portions. These are your legs, right? FC portions. And then this is your chest. And then if you, if you straighten out your hands, your arms, at the very ends of your arms are your hands. Your hands are the ones that have the ability to pick up two identical antigens, okay? So that's sort of a way to look at these things. If you actually zoom in to what's happening here, right? If you zoom in to this thing, what is happening is that the antibody and antigen, again, are interacting with each other through any of these, any combination of these types of intermolecular interactions. So there's hydrogen bonding, there's these ionic interactions that we talked about, salt bridges, there's the hydrophobic type, London dispersion interactions, and then there's the, again, here's another one with an ionic bond. So these antigen antibody, these are not covalent. There's never disulfide bonds or covalent bonds in these two interacting with each other. Only in maintaining the structural integrity of the immunoglobulin itself is where we have um, disulfide bonds. But the antigen-antibody interactions are entirely non-covalent, okay? So that means that they can attach and detach and attach and detach. Depending on how many of these interactions are occurring, that's the strength of that binding between the immunoglobulin and the antigen. So because these antibodies are capable of binding um, several antigens at the same time, what ends up happening is that these aggregates tend to form. So when your body is invaded by these infectious, potentially harmful, noxious agents. It can be toxins. It can be all sorts of different things. When you have multiple antibodies floating around, the antibodies are able to sort of form this swarm, if you will, of antibodies, and they sort of trap. Look how they trap all of those antigens to form this enormous aggregate. And then what happens is that these aggregates can be trapped can be trapped, here's sort of an aggregate over here. These aggregates can be trapped by cells, okay? And cells can recognize the FC portions of immunoglobulins, and they can um, then recognize them and trap them and bring them in and destroy them. So this slide is trying to illustrate, in fact, some of the uh, unique functions of immunoglobulins, which are very important uh, for uh, defense against infectious agents. So let me just walk you through it. Again, if we look at the structure, oh, if we look at the structure of an antibody here in the middle, again, we have the two antigen binding sites. So let's say you have some microbe, some toxin, some something, right, that is invading the body and it is noxious, the body starts to recognize it. So initially, the type of cell that uh, produces these antibodies are called B lymphocytes. So if you, you, you should have, you must have studied, uh, or I imagine you studied in a previous course, the different categories of blood cells. So there's the red blood cells, and then amongst the white blood cells, there's different categories. There are neutrophils, there are eosinophils, there are basophils, there are mast cells, and there are lymphocytes, okay? Um, and then, of course, there's platelets, that is a whole other category. But the category of cells 
white blood cells that produce antibodies are called B lymphocytes. There's B and there's T lymphocytes, okay? So before you've ever been exposed to any type of antigen, these B cells are carrying the immunoglobulins on their cell membrane, on their surface, okay? The cells are produced by the bone marrow. They wander around the body in specific ways that we'll learn in immunology, those of you who are taking immunology. And then if and when they find the antigen that they're meant to <coughs> intercept, that's the point where there's an initial interaction between that surface immunoglobulin and that antigen. So what happens is that this is internalized by the cell. The cell is then completely activated because it's told, I found my antigen, I need to turn this process on, I'm gonna start mass producing the immunoglobulins. So two things happen. A pool of what we call memory cells arise, and those cells are gonna be there for the next time you get exposed. So this is why immunization, i.e. vaccination, is so important in the population. Because if you give somebody either a live attenuated antigen or the portions of an antigen that are known to elicit a strong immune response, that elicits the production of memory cells such that when you get exposed to the real thing in a real life situation, you are already protected. Not only does that happen, but in addition to the pool of memory cells, a set of what we call plasma cells are produced and these are the ones that secrete antibodies and mass produce them. So after immunization, this also happens with a real infection, right? But what happens is that many infectious agents are deadly. And if you were to just run the risk and go out there and get the infection, you've been you could die from the infection, right? If you're given a vaccine, you can then have your immune system produce the memory cells that are gonna save you the second time, and it produces those plasma cells that are gonna mass secrete these antibodies into your bodily fluids. And again, the second time you get exposed, you're gonna have not only the memory cells that are gonna come in and produce even more, you already have boatloads of antibodies floating around in your bodily fluids that when that antigen comes in, it gets intercepted, intercepted. If you go out there and get an infection and you've not been immunized, you're on your own. The body is starting from scratch. There's no memory cells. There's no floating immunoglobulins. Good luck with that, right? So this is why vaccination is so important. Anyway, once you have these immunoglobulins floating around, these entities will be coded, completely intercepted, and that's what then allows cells to come along and destroy. So if you don't have these antibodies preformed in your body when you get exposed, it's much more difficult to get rid of those infections. Now, it turns out there are certain immunoglobulins that are ultimately find a home on the surface of one of these classes of cells that are called eosinophils. And these cells are very important in intercepting a particular type of microbe that are also very important in eradicating them. And then just to give you a little bit of information about how allergic responses actually happen, depending on the antigen, depending on how you respond to it, depending on how you were exposed to it, and depending on your genetic makeup, it turns out that certain immunoglobulins are produced that end up finding a home on the surface of a class of cell known as mast cells. And then when you get exposed the second time, that's when you develop an allergic response. So some allergic responses are the result of upon being exposed for the first time, that's not when you develop the allergic uh, response. It's when you get exposed the second time, depending on what class of antibodies you produced and where they ended up, if they ended up on mast cells, that's when you get exposed the second time, that's when these mast cells are activated. They generate a whole bunch of different inflammatory mediators, among them histamine. That's why you take antihistamines for allerg uh, allergic responses. And um, so an allergy can be the result of that type of an exposure. So when you get stung by a bee and you end up being allergic to bees, it's not the first time. The first time 
this happened and this happened and those antibodies ended up on mast cells. Why? Entirely unclear. It's a combination of all those things that I've said. And then when you get stung the second time, that's when it happens. Same thing with all allergies, peanut allergies, you know, whatever you can technically be allergic to anything, right? The first time you prime yourself, that's when this happens. When you see the antigen the second time, that's when the, the activation of the mast cell happens. And that's when you are aware that you're allergic to something. These are sort of anomalies, if you will. This is sort of an anomaly. It's entirely unclear why this happens. This is the good, this is the good part over here, right? When you are exposed for the first time, you produce the memory cells, you produce the boatloads of antibodies that then allows when you really get exposed the second time uh, that you have immunity to get rid of that particular uh, entity. All right, so um, this next section talks about things that you learned a little bit in lab. So I'm, we have about another four minutes. I'm gonna start introducing the concept of denaturation. Um, so denaturation is an irreversible unfolding of a protein that once it has become unfolded and unraveled, it is no longer functional. Because as we've discussed, the primary sequence forms, it starts folding into secondary structural elements, and then those ultimately come together to give the protein its final tertiary structure. Any additional modifications that need to happen will happen. That finally gives its protein its final structure, which then gives it its final function. The moment structure is lost, function will automatically go with it, okay? So because denaturation involves disruption of quaternary tertiary and secondary structure, that will ultimately impede the protein from being properly folded and the protein cannot come back. Turns out refolding of proteins is not possible because since proteins are such enormously large structures, as they are being constructed, there's a whole other set of proteins, if you will. This is like the chicken and the egg type of thing, right? There's a whole other set of proteins that are part of the machinery that are associated with protein synthesis that whose function is to assist other proteins with them folding properly and acquiring their proper three-dimensional shape. Once that's done and the protein has gone about its way, these assist proteins we call chaperones, molecular chaperones, whose function is to help with the folding of proteins. Once they're done, that protein is folded. If it unfolds, it's, it's done. It can do, no, long, it can do no, no more of its function. Notice that primary structure has nothing to do with denaturation. It's only when it unravels. The primary structure remains. It's the sequence of amino acids. But when you disrupt quaternary, tertiary, or secondary structure and the protein unravels, that's when it's become denatured. So what can cause denaturing? Well, it can be a wide variety of different chemical agents that interfere with all of the interactions that are responsible for holding the protein together. It can actually also be a physical process that it's physically destroyed by a variety of different ways. Again, anything that interferes with all of these non-covalent and covalent interactions that maintain secondary tertiary or quaternary structure. So what are they? Can we're talking about acids or bases. Anytime you change the hydrogen ion concentration, protons, either adding or removing, that causes changes in the charges on the surface or within the confines of a protein, that causes it to completely lose its shape. Metal ions can trickle into the structures of proteins and completely unravel them. Soaps and detergents do the same thing. Oxidizing, reducing agents, if anything is oxidized or reduced, changes its structure, it changes its ability to interact with other things, that automatically inhibits the ability of those entities to perform their job. And then of course, physically you can heat them, you can grind them, you can subject them to high uh, sound waves that's gonna completely make things vibrate to the point where they start you know, destroying themselves and that's gonna lead to, to, um, to denaturation. Um, I just want to go back very quickly and mention about the chaperone proteins and the, and, the, and the normal folding. These diseases you probably have heard of, mad cow disease, prion diseases, coastal Jacob disease, all of those have to do with chaperones that are disrupted that do not allow for proteins to properly fold.
In some cases, they actually fold improperly, and that's what leads to the diseases that we, again, become manifest as disease. All right, so it's 12.15. That's it for today. We'll continue with denaturation uh, next Tuesday. Remember, we have a quiz on Monday at 3.30, and I hope everybody had a, have a great afternoon and a good weekend, and this is it for today. Thank you very much.